before we do finish, tell our listeners how they can get hold of your podcast. Yep. So the podcast is called Assassinations Podcast, and you can find us by going to our website, assassinationspodcast.com. You can also find us on Twitter at Assassins Pod. And of course, we're, we can be found on uh, iTunes and Stitcher and your podcatchers of choice. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello. Welcome to another episode of History Hack. We have got something very interesting lined up for you guys today. So we have with us Neil, who is the host and creator of the Assassinations podcast. He's originally from Scotland and he's now based in New Orleans. His podcast looks at assassinations through history. And we're really, really, really excited to have him here. Hi, Neil. Hi, hi, it's great to join you. This is so exciting because we found you and then we kind of threw at you saying, right, give us five assassinations, uh, not necessarily fun assassinations, but give us five assassinations through history that we can talk about. And that's exactly what you've done. You went away, you came back, and you've given us five assassinations to talk about. Yes, well, I tried to pick some that were fun, uh, if you can call it that. I I do think that the further back you go into the recesses of history, the more fun you can have with subjects. So uh, I try to pick a few throughout the the range of of history from way, way back when we can really have a bit of a joke about terrible things, (laughs) right up to more contemporary events where we have to be respectful and rightly so. Exactly. I mean, I'm really, really looking forward to number four, because if people haven't heard of number four, when we get to it, I'll be really disappointed. But then we've also got some really interesting, uh, interesting, more contemporary assassinations as well, which we'll get to, which will be our number one. So, okay, hit us. Number five, who did you choose? Who are they? And why did you choose them? Okay, well, for number five, I picked Jorg Jenach. Uh, and I picked him because it's uh, sort of a great Halloween type subject because it involves a costumed killer. So Jorg was a 17th century Swiss politician and soldier and church minister as well, sort of a jack of all trades. Uh, and he, as a youngish man, got into a fight with a powerful man in Switzerland called Pompeius von Planta. He had some good names back then. So Jorg killed Pompeius, or had him killed, and it was rather gruesome. He had Pompeius killed with an axe, and the axe was driven through his chest so deeply it pinned him to the floor. So this is... This is terrible stuff. That's and some our hardcore. Bond, That's some really oh, hardcore, hardcore killing. It's like serial killer type killing. You know, our boy Jorg does not mess about. But anyway, he gets into a bit of trouble because Pompeius had, he was a powerful man and he had friends. He had a powerful family. So largely because of this, Jorg fled Switzerland for Italy. So he was a soldier. He was very religious. So Italy was a great place to be because they were always fighting about religion. So he did a spot of warfare there for a few years. Um, He ended up getting thrown into prison for fighting with his commanding officer. And um, he was a Protestant. He was a, a Calvinist. But while he was in prison in Italy, he converted to Catholicism and became a hardcore Catholic zealot, if you like. Um, But anyway, after getting out of prison in Italy, he made his way back to Switzerland and he entered into the service of powerful Catholic forces in Switzerland. Uh, And he did very well for himself, actually. He became a very wealthy man. So one day he was out celebrating his success And this was during Carnival, uh, which is, I think, something like Mardi Gras. I live here in New Orleans, and Mardi Gras is an absolutely fabulous time of year. Everyone dresses up, everyone goes out and enjoys parades and parties, and social divisions come down in the city. So rich and poor alike will sort of jostle 
shoulder to shoulder, elbow to elbow along the parade routes. And it's a great equaliser. Um, it's a wonderful time of year. So I imagine it was something similar in Switzerland and everyone was out partying. So Jorg and his friends were in a tavern drinking and I think uh, they would probably have been in costume, in masks, as was common. And then another group of revelers arrived in the tavern. And one of this new party of people who had come in was dressed as a bear. And this bear goes up to Jorg, taps him on the shoulder with his claw, and then strikes at him with an axe. So a big rammy, as we say in Scotland, occurs. They're all fighting each other, axes and swords. And sadly for Jorg, he ends up getting an axe right through his skull. And that does for him. Yep. So we don't know for sure. It's surrounded in the, the, myth, the, the mists of history. But it has been suggested, rumour has it, that the assassin was none other than the daughter of Pompeius von Planta, and that she had used the very same axe to kill Jorg as he had used to dispatch her father many years before. Oh, I love that. That's such a, that's such a historical sort of thing. You know, it was the daughter, it was the son. You know, they get in revenge Uh, with the same axe, like, ooh. Yes. And interestingly, it was, of course, it's a bit of a legend. Was he killed by an axe? Is this just sort of poetic license by storytellers and historians at the time? But there's actually some forensic evidence that emerged that kind of supports this story because archaeologists discovered a skeleton in a cathedral in Switzerland uh, in the 1950s and it was unidentified but it was clearly an important person you could tell by the clothing that the body was buried in that this was a wealthy person so it was all a bit of a mystery but then as um, forensic uh, capabilities developed a little bit they were able to analyze the body they analyzed the DNA and what they discovered was that from the DNA, the hair colour, the eye colour, and also by looking at the clothes, this would appear to resemble, uh, this person resembled a picture that was known to be of Jorg Jenach. Uh, so they thought, well, maybe this, maybe this is this historical figure, I wonder. So they did a couple of other things. They did some more research and um, they came to the conclusion that, yep, it probably was our boy Jorg. But looking at the skull of the skeleton, it was pretty clear that he had been killed with a blunt force trauma similar to what you would have if you were attacked from the rear with an axe. So it does lend support to the idea that he might very well have been killed with the the axe that he had used It's not a slam dunk, but it's a pretty good indicator that that legend might very well be true. I love that. I love if a legend can be true. It kind of makes it a little bit more magical in a way. It it, it does. In a twisted way, it makes it more magical. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, number four. Very much looking forward to number four. We love on this podcast, number four. Number four, we went... Well, we're going back into ancient times, which is, if everybody's ready, we are talking about Caligula. Yes. The craziest uh, one of all. I, I don't know. Was he really the craziest one of all? Well, was he? That's the question. Um, definitely one of the most colourful characters I've covered. Um, good old Gaius Caesar Augustus Germanicus, better known to us into the world as the Emperor Caligula. Probably one of the most notorious figures in all of history. Uh, I think even among the ranks of Roman emperors, he kind of stands out to most people as a real rotter. Uh, He's been depicted in literature and on film 
has absolutely start raving mad. I think particularly, I'm sure you've seen it as well, of John Hurt's portrayal of Caligula in the TV series I, Claudius. Oh, yes. And, uh, and also, of course, Malcolm McDowell's scene-chewing performance in the notorious movie Caligula from the 1970s. I don't know if you've seen that. No, I haven't. Nineteen seventy uh, before my time, nineteen seventy. <laughs> well, it's before my time as well, but I, you know, um, I think it's from seventy nine, and the movie is bonkers. It's it's notorious. It has a fabulous cast as well as McDowell. You've got Helen Mirren and uh, John Gugud. Uh, who else is in it? Peter O'Toole is in it. It's just a brilliant cast. And they all signed up for this movie thinking it was a historical epic, not realizing that the movie was actually made by Hustler magazine and they wanted it to be a porno. So the movie starts as like a semi-serious, well, almost serious movie. And by halfway through, it's like, oh, no, it's a porno. So all the actors basically refused to have anything to do with it. And actually, I think the director dropped out as well. Oh, wow. Um, I did not know that. Yeah, no, Caligula is a really wacky movie. Uh, but anyway, that these Caligula just lends himself to outrageous things, you know, um, And I feel, however, he's one of these historical figures who's been painted in a terrible light by historians, especially the classical historians, who, of course, had their own political reasons for dumping on him. Personally, I do have rather a lot of sympathy for Caligula. I mean, almost his entire family was murdered uh, by his uncle and well, probably other people in the in the Julio Claudian family, so Emperor Tiberius probably had various members of his family killed. Then, as a teenager, Caligula was held more or less captive on Tiberius's private island hideout on Capri, in constant fear for his life. And there's lots of rumours about what's going on on Capri, lots of ideas that maybe it's absolutely debauched and there's all these orgies going on, which uh, may or may not be true. That might be a little bit of exaggeration and slander coming from Rome, because I think the Roman elite couldn't understand why Tiberius wouldn't want to live in Rome, because it's the greatest place in the world. Uh, It could be that Tiberius just really hated Rome, um, He certainly chose to spend a lot of time away from it before he was emperor. But anyway, um, regardless, Caligula is stuck on Capri, and it's a minor miracle that he survived into adulthood. And he may only have been able to do so because he was very smart, very good at controlling his emotions and skilled at hiding his true thoughts. He had to suck up to his murderous uncle and navigate all the court intrigues that plagued life on Capri. And he had to do that the whole time with a smile on his face. Uh, So anyway, I guess his, um, his lucky number came up when old Tiberius popped his sandals and Caligula was declared the new emperor. And it would seem at least in his early days, and this is acknowledged by the classical historians to a certain extent as well, he was a pretty good ruler, or at least someone who could take good advice. Uh, And he was certainly extremely popular with the common people. Uh, There are a few busts of Caligula, and it would seem he was quite a handsome young man. He was from an incredibly popular family. He was the son of Germanicus, who was one of the great and most favoured generals of Rome, whose memory was revered by the Roman people. So when Caligula first entered into Rome um, after his effective captivity on Capri, crowds line the streets all the way to Rome, and there's people just weeping with joy when he enters the city. And those early days, those early years, 
um, or months anyway of his of his reign, he seems to be a you know fairly good and popular emperor. But he made enemies. That's not surprising. Partly that was his own fault. But he was also the subject of near constant scheming, even by those closest to him. And he he really seems to have lost it after he discovered that his own sister, Julia Agrippina, one of the few other members of his family to have survived Tiberius, had joined a plot to murder him. This was a horrible betrayal, as it would be for anyone, and it really shattered him. Um, And despite that, despite that betrayal, and despite the fact that he would have been quite within his rights to execute his sister, he spared his sister's life, only sending her into exile. But it seems to me that after that, Caligula basically stopped trying to be a good emperor. He just couldn't keep up the pretense. He knew that the same senators who bowed and scraped and professed their love for him were secretly plotting against him. So he started to treat them horribly. And the more horribly he treated them, the lower they bowed and scraped. Um, Famously, he's supposed to have made his horse, Incitatus, a senator. Uh, And this is usually taken as a sign that Caligula was mad. But if that story is true, then it seems to me that was a display of high satire by the emperor. Not by a mad emperor, but by someone who is holding a mirror up to a society that he despises. Uh, Anyway, uh, things got to the point that much of the Roman elite just wanted to get rid of him. Uh, Probably the straw that broke the camel's back was when he declared himself a living god and demanded (laughs) people actually worship him, which they did. Um, So poor poor old god Caligula was stabbed to death during a theatrical performance in Rome to be replaced by dear old Uncle Claudius. And of course, old Claudius was himself most likely assassinated, probably by his wife. And his wife was Julia Agrippina, Claudia, uh, Caligula's sister, uh, the one he'd sent into exile. And I think you know, we could speak a lot about uh, Julia Agrippina. She was a very remarkable woman, one of the great political players of ancient Rome and a dab hand at assassinations, uh, as well as being the mother of the Emperor Nero. So we did a podcast with one of my former lecturers, um, Catherine Edwards, at the beginning of uh, us starting this podcast back in April. Mm -hmm. And we did a whole, literally a whole podcast talking about Agrippina. And uh, I love her. I think she's great. She's, She's such a badass, you know, especially when it comes down to Nero and things like that. She's uh, she's definitely one of my favourite Roman women. Yeah, uh, she was playing in a ruthless world, and she was as ruthless as as any of them. And she was a she was a politician. She, uh, how could you put it? I think in order to survive in that environment, you had to be tough and smart. And she survived through some of the worst times and she really ended up on top exactly exactly well ne- ne- nearly uh yeah. her down- downfall wasn't quite <laughs> quite as well, a, but she-, she was smart she was a very smart woman well we all die and in rome you you quite often died pretty quickly so she might very well have thought well my uppance is going to come one day, but I'm going to make. Sh- I'm going to try my damnedest to make sure that I'm. <laughs> I get what I want before then. Which is very true. Right, let's move on to number three. Uh, number three, Georgi Markov. Tell us about him. Yes, we're going to have to zoom forward about 1900 years, and that's uh, not a problem. We always love like modern modern history yes. is fine. <laughs> so to 1978. Uh, Georgi Markov, a Bulgarian writer who went into exile in the early 1970s. He was very 
He was big in Bulgaria. <laughs> he was uh, very famous there. He was the most famous writer and kind of a kind of a suave figure. If you can have a suave figure in communist Bulgaria, then it was Georgi Markov. Um, but he, I mean, it's kind of complex and not entirely clear, but basically he fell afoul of the regime there, of the government there, to which he had previously been fairly close. Uh, and he ends up in Britain and he works for the BBC. And he also works for um, Radio Free Europe occasionally. So he is, you know, it's, it's not a very glamorous job, but he, he does broadcasts in Bulgarian going, you know, being beamed into the Eastern Bloc, beamed into uh, his, uh, his old country. And he does work for the BBC World Service as well. And he has some beef with the government in Sofia. And he, he does some broadcasts that they're, they're very uh, negative towards the leader of communist Bulgaria, Todor Zhivkov, and other members of the nomenclatura there. So he uh, starts to get threats. He starts to get these messages saying, look, you better stop this or else. And Markov doesn't really take these threats too seriously. He thinks, well... I'm just, you know, they're just trying to spook me because I'm doing these very negative uh, broadcasts on the radio and they really just want me to, to be quiet. But he isn't too worried about it. So anyway, in 1978, he is on his way to work at Broadcasting House in the West End of London. And he's waiting on, um, I think he's waiting for a bus at... Uh, just outside the South Bank Centre, which is not that far away. So he's waiting there and he feels a jab on his leg and sees someone nearby drop an umbrella on the ground and muttering something. And then this person seemingly gets into a taxi cab and zooms off. And Markov doesn't really think too much more about it. But... The next day, he starts to feel pretty ill. And then the day after that, he's in hospital. And uh, he doesn't really know what happened. He's mentioned to a couple of people the strange incident at the bus stop. And he said, you know, he, he doesn't really know what happened. But, like, I don't know, was, was this person involved? Like, he, he really isn't sure. But, um, unfortunately, sadly, he dies of multiple organ failure and his doctor thinks that maybe he was bitten by a snake uh, you know he basically they're going through the medical textbook saying what the heck is wrong with this guy he's deteriorating so fast with so much wrong with him you know maybe it's some kind of tropical illness but they're not sure however when he dies scotland yard instantly assumes that this was some kind of politically motivated killing which seems a little bit odd because, yes, he's a Bulgarian exile. Arguably, you could say he's a dissident. Though I don't think that's how he would have described himself. Um, but it's odd that they would go immediately to he might have been the victim of assassination. Nonetheless, his death is investigated by the Scotland Yard anti-terrorism squad. So maybe they know something. Um, and one of Markov's friends at the BBC and Markov's wife, um, Annabelle as well, gives some interviews to newspapers and they talk about the umbrella. And this story, this myth emerges that Markov was killed with, the, with a poisoned umbrella that either fired out a poisoned pellet or had, was poison tipped. So this becomes a, probably the biggest story in Britain, maybe even the biggest story in the world for a few weeks. The, the idea, this James Bond-esque killing with a, a modified umbrella where this poor Bulgarian dissident is struck down by Bulgarian spies or KGB operatives. Very sensational story. And I went in to research this case 
thinking that. Like, that's the story I heard, and that's what I really assumed was the case. Uh, but the more I researched, the more I, I discovered that that's actually not true at all. Um, though the story of the, the poisoned umbrella or the umbrella gun is, is very famous, uh, it's almost certainly to, it, it's, we, I think we can say definitely, it's not true. Actually, if you go back and look through the newspaper records, you'll see that Annabelle Markov actually a few months later said, well, you know, I was kind of confused and I was hearing different things from different people and I really don't think it was an umbrella. Maybe the guy just had an umbrella. You know, the person standing near Georgie when he when he was at the bus stop had an umbrella that was dropped. So, but by that time, the story was out there and there was no squeezing the toothpaste back into the tube. It was done. That was the myth and the legend. That's actually um, an impressive legend. Um, I yes. Would it even been possible to do something with that kind of technology in the 70s? Yeah, the technology existed. Um, both uh, the CIA and the KGB, and I would imagine whoever the real life Q is in Britain, actually did have various household items that could uh, that had compressed gas and could be used as a weapon. There were there were pens. You know, it's like James Bond. There were actually pens with compressed gas cylinders that could fire something. Uh, so it's not that it's impossible. Uh, it's just that in this case, it is so highly improbable. There, first of all, the idea that it was an umbrella is really just circumstantial because all Markov appears to have said was someone dropped an umbrella. And this story just metastasized into something else. But um, the forensic examination of Markov's body uh, well, the examination when he was in hospital, and then subsequently, there was there were some pretty serious problems with the account. Now, a pellet was discovered in Markov's leg. Now, that would tend to indicate that he was shot with the poison. Uh, now, whether or not that came from an umbrella seems very unlikely, because you know, you're talking about this rather unwieldy object and what you're kind of using it like a gun and firing it. When, in fact, if you're going to inject someone with a slow-release pellet, you just use a syringe. You just walk by someone and stick them. That makes much more sense. Um, all the, um, the forensic evidence, looking at Markov's jeans he was wearing he was wearing a pair of Levi's or something at the time there was no fraying on the on the denim indicating that something had been fired and yet this pellet had been found in his body uh, and there were various hypotheses about what might have happened uh, but none of them really add up that well and that's why we start to get into kind of murky territory here sort of cold war intrigue and uncertainty because the pellet probably couldn't have been fired because it was so tiny i mean really really tiny and it had to have been covered with a coating to keep the poison inside so firing it from anything would likely have damaged this coating that had to be on the pellet and it would have been a very difficult way to get such a, you know, to get into the, the blood supply. Whereas using a needle, now that's possible, but then why inject someone with a pellet? The bore of the needle would have to have been very large and it would have been extremely painful and probably would have produced blood. But there was no blood on Markov's genes. So that kind of doesn't make sense. Nonetheless, Markov died. This pellet was discovered seemingly in a tissue sample taken from his body at the autopsy. And uh, it was believed or suggested that he was killed with anthrax, though that was never confirmed. And then to make things a little bit more mysterious and confusing, uh, around the same time, another Bulgarian uh, who lived in Paris claims that he too was shot with exactly the same type of pellet. 
But there's a lot that's difficult to believe about the story of the Bulgarian in Paris who was shot at the same time, supposedly, with this bullet. Because some of the account that he gives and his wife gave about what happened is impossible. Um, He and his wife at one point say there was a scorch mark where he was hit with the pellet. But there, there wouldn't be a scorch mark from anything fired by an air gun and a pellet couldn't be fired from a conventional gun because the pellet is just, it, just physically impossible. So there's a lot in this story about Markov that is extremely difficult to believe. And you've got this, what appears on the surface to be a James Bond spy story that we then discover, well, that legend probably isn't true. And then when we look further, everything has to be called into question because a lot of it is really difficult to believe. And we're left wondering, well, what really happened? Who killed Markov? I don't know the answer to that, but I'm going to say that um, basically everything you've heard about the Markov case, doubt it. Do you know what? I always love a a case like that. But anyway, moving on, moving on. We've got number two. Uh, so we have Patrice uh, Lumumba, if I pronounce that correctly. Yeah, Patrice Lumumba, um, who was really, a, it's really one of the most uh, fascinating and tragic stories that I've looked at. He was an African freedom fighter, uh, a leader of the independence movement in the Belgian Congo. Uh, so Belgium ruled a huge empire in Central Africa and in the post-war period in common with other African areas there was an independence movement and Patrice Lumumba was one of the leaders of that independence movement and he became the first prime minister of an independent Congo in 1960. But the Belgians had given Congo independence really in name only. And they and the Americans really very quickly worked to undermine any chance of the government or a central government in Congo having any real power. The Belgians wanted to retain control of the wealthiest mineral producing region of the Congo. Uh, which they did, and eventually, you know, within a few months of independence or nominal independence, they just broke that wealthy energy or, or um, resource-rich area away from the rest of the country. So the whole thing descends into civil war, and Patrice Lumumba ends up being uh, arrested. Now, Lumumba had made the mistake of during all of this conflict, trying to get some support from the Soviet Union. So the Americans were already not a huge fan of him to begin with, but when he looked for support from the Soviet Union, Omumba, that was it. Basically, his his days were numbered. So he's arrested, and it would appear uh, that the United States Central Intelligence Agency arranged for him to be able to escape from his captivity. Uh, And he was then captured by rival forces and taken to uh, the Belgian controlled area of the Congo where he was executed. He was, um, I say executed, it would really be more appropriate to say he was assassinated, he was kidnapped and he he was murdered. And the Belgians were involved. The Belgians were there. Years later, officials in Belgium came forward to say, look, we knew all about this. We planned it. We were there. And allegedly, it was uh, personnel from the CIA who arranged to to dispose of Omumba's body. Uh, And apparently, uh, there, there had been a plan previously by the CIA to murder him using poisoned toothpaste, which which didn't happen. But um, basically, they got their way by, by less subtle means. Uh, and for me, it's an interesting case uh, for many reasons, but one of them, it, it shows just how treacherous a global politics can be. 
and how, at least in geopolitical terms, Western democracies can be every bit as ruthless and murderous as any dictatorship. Our final choice um, is someone we've actually done a podcast on this incredible human being, but we haven't really talked much too much about his assassination. So let's talk about Martin Luther King. Yes, uh, Martin Luther King murdered in Memphis in April of 1968. So he was staying at the Lorraine Motel in the city. He was there as part of a political and social campaign that he was leading. Uh, It was called the Poor People's Campaign. And it was an effort to connect struggles for racial justice with struggles for social justice. Um, So there were striking sanitation workers in the city and King... King's politics in the 1960s really evolved. He, by that stage in 68, he was one of the leading anti-war figures as well as being one of the leading figures against poverty and inequality. So he'd gone from fighting from, for civil rights uh, for black people, which he was still fighting for, but that had expanded into a broader political platform that involved uniting the struggles of poor black and white people for social change in America, combined with this growing opposition to the Vietnam War. So this is not making Martin Luther King a popular person in the corridors of power in Washington, D.C., to say the least. So anyway, he is in Memphis uh, in April for uh, this effort to support the sanitation workers. He's staying at the Lorraine Motel, which is a Black-owned business that civil rights leaders and entertainers quite often stayed at. Um, And he's standing on the balcony and he's shot uh, and dies uh, shortly afterwards in hospital. So huge manhunt takes place and eventually a man called James Errol Ray is arrested in Heathrow Airport in London um, and sent back to the United States. Now, Ray, a little bit about him. He was a petty criminal. He'd spent much of his life popping in and out of jail. Uh, and he, he, he was actually a fugitive. He had broken out of prison um, about a year or so before the killing of Dr. King. Uh, and he was on the run. Now, Ray claimed that during the year or so that he was on the run, he was working for a man, a mysterious man called Raoul, who was giving him various tasks and sending him all over the country and into Mexico, operating basically as a, as a gun runner, uh, a gun smuggler, uh, and doing some other tasks. And he, he was all over the place. And he said that he was sent to these different areas by this handler called Raul. And that he was told by Raul in, in Atlanta, I believe, to go and purchase a gun, which he did, which was for him unexceptional because he was buying and selling guns. That was basically his job. And then he was told, go to Memphis, wait in this rooming house, and I'll come get you. So Ray said that basically he was only in Memphis because he was told to do it, and he only had purchased this gun because he was told to do it by someone else who he'd been working for for quite a long time. However, shortly after his arrest in 68, he did confess to killing Dr. King. However, within, I think, uh, two or three days of making that confession, he said, actually, no, look, I, I didn't do it. I made this confession under duress. Um, I was not the person who shot Dr. King. I didn't do it. So that recantation of his confession, so shortly after he made it, was being considered by a judge. And that judge um, died of a heart attack in his office just before he was due to make a decision as to whether or not he was going to accept Ray's uh, recanting of his confession. The replacement judge who was brought in 
um, dismissed it and said, no, he's confessed to the crime. He's he's going to spend 99 years in prison. And that was that. And that was it over. Well, we say that's it over. Ray continued to fight against his conviction. And a number of people believed him, including most of the King family, including Coretta Scott King, uh, the widow. So she and a couple of Dr. King's children believed that James Earl Ray was not the killer and that Dr. King had been murdered as part of a broader conspiracy. So there were, there was a civil case that came out of that in the 1990s and the civil case found that King had been murdered as part of a broader conspiracy involving um, elements in the mafia and in the United States government uh, at the at the national and at the, and at the local level, uh, and there was also uh, a little bit earlier, actually in the late 1970s, there was uh, the House of Representatives Subcommittee on Assassinations, which looked at the the killing of King and also of JFK, and uh, the subcommittee finding was that. King had been killed as part of a broader conspiracy, though that the subcommittee did think that uh, Ray had been the person who pulled the trigger. However, that's that to me is very far from clear. A number of people have come out over the years to say that they were involved in some way in a plot to kill Dr. King, a plot that involved the mafia and involved elements within the US government, and that really James Earl Ray had been a patsy. So it's um, there's a, a, a lot of evidence that would indicate that the official account here was not correct. And that evidence was even tested in a court. And yet, despite all that, uh, I think most people who know about the case still assume that James Earl Ray was the lone killer, which would appear at the very least that he, if he was involved, it was part of a, a much broader conspiracy. We'll never really know the truth, though, will we? Um, sometimes we don't need to know the truth. I think sometimes it's enough to know that the official version of things isn't the truth. That is also very true. Yeah. Neil, listen, thank you so much for joining us and giving us an overview of uh, five of these assassinations. Oh, no, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure speaking with you.